It's crew time time. <gasps> Hi guys, welcome back in today's episode of Crew Time. Crew Time. Crew Time. Crew Time. Hi, welcome. Welcome to Crew Time. My name is Sarah if you didn't know that. So if you are new here, what we're doing is I am telling a crew crime story that is super interesting and putting on makeup while I do it. But we've already agreed that we like it, so we're doing it. Is it a weird combination? Yes, we know. This is a really good one. It's gonna be long. Hopefully I can make it into one video. I don't wanna split it up. Bring a snack, bring a beverage. Um, what is the story that we are talking about today? You might ask. Well, you already know if you clicked on the video. <laughs> I am on a roll today. This foundation jar, the pump is so gross right now. Like it's everywhere. This is the story of the murder of Lacey Peterson. Okay, so I know that I've said that I try to find crew crime stories that I can sort of relate to and uh, or connect in some way, but for this particular story, it's just plain interesting. It's just a good, it's a good story. I mean, it's a terrible story, but. Okay, so this case was so sensational. Um, leaf blower. Fucking leaf blower out there. Hold please. I don't live in California. I did not live in California at the time of the story. I, I'm, I read books about it. Books plural. I had multiple books about this case. Like this one really got me. I want to say when all of this happened, I was probably like early 20s. I mean, I guess I could do the math. Yeah, I was like 21. And this was one of those cases that really got me into crew crime. This has nothing to do with the story. Sorry. Okay. On December 24th, Christmas Eve 2002, 27-year-old Lacey Peterson was reported missing from her home in Modesto, California. What made this particularly shocking was, you know, other than it was on Christmas Eve, is that she was super pregnant at the time. Lacey Denise Rocha grew up in Modesto, California, an idyllic farming forward community in California's Central Valley, kind of between Sacramento, Fresno, San Francisco area closest to Stockton. And it's also the home to the largest winery in the world. It's the Ernest and Julio Gallo. It's available literally, literally anywhere wine is sold. <laughs> They're the makers of like Andre, Boone's Farm, Barefoot. If it's in a box, they probably make it. <laughs> I mean, no shade. So anyway, Lacey grew up in box wine country <laughs> and attended Cal Poly State University where she met and fell for a dashing young student, agricultural business major named Scott Peterson. Scott grew up in La Jolla. He excelled at golf. He was described as a model student, just like a model son. Lacey and Scott dated for two years. Things got serious. They moved in together and they eventually married in um, August of 1997. After they both graduated from Cal Poly, they settled into married life, just kind of taking it easy, enjoying being married. And then they soon decided to move to Modesto, where Lacey was from, to start their family. So, I mean, Lacey and Scott were just like kind of the perfect couple. They were really attractive, you know, young, successful, really making it. Um, they purchased a home in an upscale neighborhood near La Loma Park in Modesto. Sidewalks, parks, kids, dogs, like just very picturesque. Scott began working as a salesman for a fertilizer company and Lacey took a job as a part-time substitute teacher, but she was just really focused on being a homemaker, a wife, getting ready to be a mom. She loved cooking and entertaining and just being the perfect wife. So in 2002, Lacey learned that she was pregnant with her first child. She and Scott were going to be parents to a baby boy and they named him Connor. He was, uh, Connor was due to be born in February of 2003. On December 23rd, the day before Lacey disappeared, Scott and Lacey went to a hair salon where Lacey's sister, Amy, was a hairstylist. This concealer is too light. <laughs> <laughs> well, so when Amy was cutting Scott's hair, they were chatting. Scott mentioned that he was going to be playing golf the next day and he had offered to run an errand 
Um, it was like a gift pickup for their grandpa, their papa. The next morning, Lacey and Scott got up and got themselves ready for the day. Lacey told him that she was gonna walk their dog, Mackenzie, and make gingerbread, and then run to the store to pick up a couple of items for the next day's Christmas brunch with her family. Scott left the house just before 10 o'clock. Um, he wanted to go to his warehouse um, where he had an office to send some emails and retrieve his boat. He then had decided to go fishing because I guess it was too cold to golf. I don't know why it would be better to go fishing in the cold when you're on the water, whatever. I don't know things. He drove the 84 miles, so you know, about an hour and a half to Berkeley Marina. He went fishing for about 90 minutes and then he went home. When he left the marina, he called Lacey twice on his way home, once to leave a voicemail or message on the answering machine, you know, <laughs> to let Lacey know that he wasn't gonna be able to run that errand to pick up the gift for Papa. Um, when he called the second time, he did not leave a message. Like he spent more time driving back and forth to the marina than he did fishing, but he must've just really wanted to go. He dropped the boat back off at his warehouse location and then when he got home the house was empty and the dog Mackenzie was walking around with his leash on. Lacey's car was still in the driveway so he just assumed that her mom had come and picked her up to run errands together. So it was after he had showered and threw his you know stinky fishing clothes in the washer that he got some pizza out of the fridge you know having a little snacky snack just waiting for Lacey to come back. And then he checked the answering machine and one of the messages on the machine was from him. So Lacey never got the message. It was then that he called Lacey's mom's house to, you know, kind of see where what was going on and they hadn't seen her. Scott had a cell phone, obviously, because he called Lacey, but I guess she didn't have one. So he started going around looking for her. The dog was home, all her stuff was there. So he thought maybe she like, I don't know, fell or got hurt or something. So he went out, to, in the neighborhood to just sort of look for her. He was knocking on the neighbor's doors. He went back to the park. Lacey's parents started calling hospitals cause you know, maybe she went into labor and called an ambulance or something. By about 5.47 PM, Lacey was officially reported to police as missing. Her stepfather called that in. The police investigation revealed that a neighbor had actually found Mackenzie, the dog wandering around the neighborhood or wandering down the street with the leash on and uh, just put him back in the Peterson's yard. So that explains why the dog was there. Lacey's keys and purse were inside the house in a closet. Scott initially had told police that he spent the day golfing, but then he told police that he had gone to fish for sturgeon in um, the San Francisco Bay via Berkeley Marina. I'm gonna put on my eyebrows cause I can't do it and talk at the same time. <laughs> So Lacey is officially reported missing. Now here's what's odd. When Scott called Lacey's mom's house to look for Lacey, he said, Lacey's missing. Not like, have you seen her? Is she there? Weird. The police came to the Peterson's house and the law enforcement officials noted that Scott was behaving kind of strangely for somebody with a missing pregnant wife on Christmas Eve. And what I mean is that he was like strangely calm, not emotional. He's real concerned about like them wearing shoes in the house, using coasters under their drinks. So at this point, a massive search kicks off, right? Police and firefighters combed the areas near the park where Lacey would have, you know, normally walked Mackenzie. Posters, flyers, websites, rewards, everything were all issued for any information leading to Lacey's safe return. Neighbors, friends, family, and community volunteers came together to look for her, up to 900 people in the first two days alone. Eventually, the story attracted national interest. The story was like inescapable. Do you remember this? So in the early points of the investigation, Scott um, initially offered to submit to a polygraph test you know, when he was asked, but then his family said, uh, you might not want to do that. And you know what? I don't blame them because first of all, polygraphs are not admissible in court as evidence. They're not reliable, but your willingness to submit to a polygraph is sort of an indication of maybe your truthfulness or any of that stuff. I mean, I would think that if I had a missing pregnant family member and somebody wanted me to take a polygraph test regarding, you know, my potential involvement, I would be like, yeah, heck yeah, I'll take the test. But I might be like so upset that maybe that would jack it up, I don't know. So like I said, when the story broke, it was everywhere, okay? The 24 hour news cycle was definitely in full effect. Nancy Grace. <laughs> 
<laughs> She's wild. Nancy Grace was all over it, okay? She was very critical of Scott Peterson publicly saying that she was like creeped out by him, that he wasn't acting right, he was like really rubbing her the wrong way, he was too cool, very suspicious, right? Lacey's family, they were standing with Scott. You know, they were a united front. Okay, so Lacey disappeared on Christmas Eve, about a month goes by, then bombshell, bombshell. <laughs> so on January 24th of 2003, a massage therapist from Fresno held a press conference. Why, who cares? 28 year old Amber Fry claimed that she had a recent romantic relationship with Scott Peterson. She didn't know he was married, he actually told her flat out that he was not married. Scott and Amber met through a mutual friend. By late November, Amber and Scott began a romantic relationship. Scott told Amber that he was single, that he traveled frequently for work. Amber had a young daughter from a previous relationship. Scott commented that he would be happy to treat this young girl as his own child, but that he didn't necessarily want any more children and in fact, was interested in having a vasectomy. He told Amber that he would be traveling to Maine to be with his parents for Christmas and that for work um, over New Year's, he would be in Paris. Mm, ooh la la. This, this press conference bombshell, right? What Slimy Scott did not know at that time was that Amber was already on to him. So a friend of Amber's was a Fresno homicide detective and when he learned who Amber's new boyfriend was, she was seeing a guy named Scott, Scott who? Scott Peterson, and he's like, huh? So this was on December 30th that her friend told her this. Okay, December 30th. Yeah, your boyfriend Scott is that Scott. Scott Peterson from Modesto with the missing pregnant wife. The missing wife for six days when, you know, he told her. Was she disgusted? Was she horrified? Yes, our girl Amber was a hero. Okay, because she went straight to the police. She told them everything. Their conversations that they had had that Scott told her that he was a widower <laughs> and that this was gonna be his first Christmas without his wife. So, okay, so Scott and Amber met in like November. She wasn't missing yet. Okay, so our girl Amber, the hero, she decided to start working with police. They put a device on her phone to start recording these conversations with Scott. So pretty much immediately after that device was put on her phone, oh, Scott was calling and they were talking all the time. There was so much footage of their recorded conversations. Ugh. Lacey is missing, legit missing. And Amber has figured out who Scott is. Scott doesn't know that Amber knows who he is. He's still maintaining his little story and they're still carrying on phone conversations. Now remember, Scott is supposed to be out searching for Lacey. Like there's headquarters, stations of people like taking phone calls and posters and all of this stuff. And Scott would like slip out to make a phone call to his girlfriend. So between the point that Amber found out who Scott was in the press conference, Amber recorded these phone calls and eventually Scott admitted to his true identity. But the details and the elaborate stories kind of lessened. So we'll get there. So shortly after admitting the truth, about who he was and how he's got this missing pregnant wife, he admitted this to Amber. Um, Scott says that he told investigators about the affair with Amber. Um, he must have known or at least suspected that it would come out. It could be possible that Amber would contact authorities maybe, or perhaps had already done so. Cause he kept talking to her after the press conference. Wild. So it's not clear whether Amber ever really had intended to go public with this relationship. It just seems like it was important for her to work with police and, you know, pursue that. I guess it would have surfaced eventually, I suppose. The National Enquirer had gotten a hold of a photograph of Amber and Scott. So when they were carrying on, la la la, like everything's fine and he's a single guy just about town, they went to a holiday party together. They were photographed together. And uh, somehow that photograph got leaked or sold to the National Enquirer. And they contacted the Modesto Police Department to kind of give them, give them a heads up. Like, hey, we're about to publish this photograph in case it ruins your investigation. So what they did at that point, the police didn't want Lacey's parents to find out through the media. I mean, they knew about Amber, but they had not revealed that to Lacey's family yet. So they told her family and when they did, this is really sad, Lacey's mom said, why did he have to kill her? So once they found out, including Amber found out that the National Enquirer had that photo, she kind of had to 
come forward. Now remember, after this press conference, they continued talking. Scott kept calling her. Isn't that weird? Telling her that he was like proud of her? Okay, Scott, you're weird. So once Lacey's family learned about Amber and Scott's lies, you know, they had been standing by him this entire time that the media was crucifying him for acting so weird. Um, but once they learned that he had been lying <laughs> about everything, they were done with his ass. They also learned that Scott sold Lacey's car and was considering selling their house, putting it up on the market. Why do that if Lacey's just missing? Either real dumb or evil genius Scott continued talking to Amber even after the press conference, right? So she never told him that their conversations were being recorded. He never indicated that he knew. So like either he figured it out and was really trying to put on a show to show that he was like doing the right thing, I guess. Or was he just like really slimy? I vote just really slimy. Anyways, those phone calls, like they continued talking well into February and it wasn't until Amber was like, you know what, I don't think we should be talking anymore. That he was like, okay. Okay, so about four days after the press conference bombshell, Scott actually sat down with Diane Sawyer for an interview on Good Morning America. Scott admitted to having the affair. He claimed that Lacey knew about it, that it quote, wasn't anything that would tear us apart. Girl. <laughs> <laughs> Diane Sawyer was not having that shit. She was like, uh, so your pregnant wife was cool with that? Sure, Jan. <laughs> so Scott said the reason that he didn't want to give interviews, because he was very weird, was he wanted to keep the press kind of hungry for more information. So he was just like sort of being a carrot to keep them around, to keep Lacey's search publicized, because he didn't want to distract from the real goal of finding Lacey, right? Think what you want about me, I'm a creep, whatever, whatever, but like, please just keep looking for Lacey. That interview didn't do anything to help Scott's reputation. He looks even worse, right? Slimy, shady, creepy. Also one of the major nuggets from that Diane Sawyer interview was that he spoke of Lacey saying that she was amazing. Past tense. So this is a lot, right? Whoa, Scott has a girlfriend. Um, he told the girlfriend he didn't want kids, although he has a pregnant wife at home. He is speaking of Lacey in the past tense. Let's look a little bit closer, okay? Fast forwarding a little bit to some stuff that came out in the investigation. It was discovered that the evening that Lacey disappeared or was reported missing, Scott subscribed to the Playboy channel. Also, um, a few days later, he subscribed to another adult entertainment channel that was a little bit more explicit. I guess Playboy channel wasn't doing it. Okay, so it's official. The media hates Scott, don't you? There's a lot of like feigned emotion when you watch the interviews. If you're a weirdo who watches all these interviews like me, he has that like weird vocal fry that a person does when they're trying to sound sad, but they're not, you know? There are literally no tears, dry crying. It's, it's the grossest. That's like the grossest thing to me was when somebody just talks like this so that they can just sound really sad. Ugh! I mean, okay, everybody reacts differently and what? This never happened to me in my life. How, how could I know how I would respond? But come, come on. Okay, so during this time, the search for Lacey continues. There are multiple reports from neighbors or other residents in the neighborhood saying that they saw Lacey walking the dog that morning. It's assumed that the police followed up on all these leads, but Scott's behavior really sort of had the police hot on that ass, you know? It doesn't seem really like the eyewitness reports were taken very seriously at all. And also it was revealed or discovered, whatever, that the house directly across the street from them was robbed the same day that Lacey disappeared. Interesting. An eyewitness neighbor says that, you know, they saw the men, you know, removing several items there on Christmas Eve morning and um, you know, that they gave him the stink eye. Those men were eventually apprehended. And the first, one of the first things they said when they were arrested was, we didn't have anything to do with that missing pregnant lady. Either they had heard that story and didn't want to get involved in it or, you know, protesting a little too much. Eventually police did acknowledge and announce that robbery occurred, but they say that the robbery occurred on 
December 26th. If that robbery happened on December 26th when they had like the entire neighborhood crawling with news reporters and nobody saw them, I don't know. I just, doesn't add up for me, but okay. I mean, to me, I, I feel like there's maybe a timeline discrepancy. The case is just sort of not really advancing, okay? No new evidence. Everyone just hates Scott. They're just watching Scott jogging, being a weirdo. By February 10th of 2003, that was Lacey's due date. It comes and goes. No Lacey. By March, it's been like three months, right? So by March, law enforcement investigators returned to the Peterson home. They returned to Scott's warehouse. They were initially denied access by Scott. Suspicious. There was one piece of evidence that was found in the boat in the warehouse. It was a rusty pair of pliers, like rusted shut, and it had one hair of Lacey's on the pliers. Now, is that an indication that maybe she was in the boat? Could be. Or maybe the pliers came from the house? I mean, my hair is everywhere. Police investigators had officially ruled Lacey's death a homicide. Or, you know, that she was no longer missing. This was a homicide. Also at this time, investigators had reissued the search of the San Francisco Bay Area and they put a tracking device on Scott's car because homeboy was acting weird. Moving forward. April 13th, 2003. A couple walking their dog happened upon the uh, decomposing body of a late term male fetus. Fetus because the umbilical cord was still attached. That's the difference. It was discovered in the, m whoa, what am I doing? <laughs> discovered in the marshy area of Richmond's Point Isabel Regional Shoreline Park, north of the Berkeley Marina. The next day, a passerby found the torso of a person, they couldn't tell, about a mile from where that fetus was found. The torso was badly decomposed. Everything was missing, arms, legs, organs, head. Five days later, on April 18th, 2003, a DNA test confirmed that the remains that had been discovered were of Lacey Peterson, the torso, and the baby Connor. The autopsy could not confirm the cause of death, of course, but it did reveal that Lacey had not labored because her cervix was still intact, and uh, it was instead decomposition that had separated the two from each other. And the baby was in much better condition than the mother, but remember he was inside of her body protected, right? So at a certain point, perhaps Lacey's body had been weighed down, anchors around her head and limbs, and maybe the churn of the water, this is getting really gross, sorry, but the churn of the water maybe loosened things until it broke apart and the baby also broke apart. So once the identity of Lacey and Connor were confirmed, the heat on Scott went way up, okay? He had been staying in San Diego with his family, allegedly to avoid media attention, okay? But the proximity to the southern border really triggered the police to close in. They arrested Scott that same day at a golf course in San Diego and what was in the car, you ask? <laughs> Almost $15,000 in cash, extra clothing, camping gear, his brother's ID card, four cell phones, and he had grown a beard and colored his hair. Well, bleached it poorly. Okay, it was like brassy and weird. I really went in there with this blush today. Ah! Got mascara all over my skin! So because the case was so crazy in the media and so popular, everybody was talking about it, they didn't think that Scott would receive a fair trial in Modesto, which is, that's true. So they moved the case to Redwood, California to afford better jury selection and aim for a more fair trial. So 50% of the jury candidates were dismissed pretty much automatically when they were being interviewed because, you know, they said they'd already made the mind up. The mind. They had already made their minds up. Scott was guilty. That story was everywhere, you know? So it was very difficult to find good jurors, impartial jurors. The prosecution dismissed any juror who, um, said that they did not believe in the death penalty. That's the sentence, death, right? What they're supposed to do for those jurors is, no, I understand that you don't believe in the death penalty. However, do you think you could set your beliefs aside and just apply the law in this case? That's what they're supposed to do, but that's not what they did. They just dismissed. So when you have a jury that is filled with like clear 100% like death penalty almost supporters, 
that's maybe not great. It's, it's gonna, it's like a angry mob. Okay, on June 1st, 2004, the trial officially began and the prosecution really leaned into the narrative that Scott didn't want to be in his marriage anymore and he certainly didn't want to be a father. They claimed that Scott must have killed Lacey on the morning of December 24th, concealed her body in a tarp, and then took her to his warehouse, put her in the boat, and then took her out into the Berkeley Marina, San Francisco Bay to dump her body. They say that, you know, he was just too far in it, in too much debt, too, it would just be too much. He just couldn't divorce her, he had to eliminate her. So the Peterson defense team really played up that, yeah, Scott was a piece of shit, okay? He was a cheater, he was a liar, he was not a good guy, but that does not make him a murderer. So even though Scott was guilty AF in the court of public opinion, there just really wasn't enough evidence to truly nail him down. There was no cause of death, there was no witnesses, there was no physical evidence besides one hair on a pair of pliers. There was no history of violence, nothing. Also, it was clear that law enforcement was really focusing all of their attention just on Scott and, you know, it kind of came out that they essentially falsified or skewed some of their reports um, and witness testimony to discredit some of those witness statements about the sighting of Lacey and also that robbery across the street that was supposed to happen when <laughs> the street was lined with media trucks. So they also said that Lacey could have been kidnapped and murdered and dumped in the bay because everybody knew that Scott had gone fishing in the bay that day. Maybe they did it to frame him. So like either he did it and he was a genius hiding in plain sight or he was just like a total sleazeball dumb dumb with terrible luck. I mean, his pregnant wife disappears while he goes fishing on Christmas Eve alone and then her body is discovered in the very place that he admitted to being at and he had a girlfriend at the time. I mean, it's a lot. So the prosecution pointed out how odd Scott's behavior was in the weeks following Lacey's disappearance. There's a striking photo of him from the candlelight vigil where he's like laughing his head off. He's supposed to be looking somber and does that make him an asshole? Yes, but does that make him guilty of murder? No. What the prosecution presented next turned it all around. Amber Fry. So the prosecution brought in Amber to testify and boy did she. <laughs> she spilled the beans about that six week relationship and Scott was supposed to be, you know, for a portion of this relationship, Scott is supposed to be searching for his pregnant wife, but he's carrying on with Amber Fry. And the prosecution, they showed the photos of them together at a Christmas party. So they played the recordings of the phone calls in the court for the jury to hear. And you've heard them, you've heard them by now. They're, they're crazy. Scott and his elaborate lies, right? He was telling Amber that he was traveling to Paris for New Year's Eve. So it's New Year's Eve and he calls Amber up and says, oh, I'm at the Eiffel Tower watching the fireworks. The show's amazing. You know where he was? At his missing wife's candlelight vigil. <coughs> Stop it. I cannot. So the other recordings captured when Scott actually admitted to who he really was. And even though he had told Amber that he had lost his wife before, Amber was like, uh, are you psychic? How did you, what do you mean? You told me that she was gone. She wasn't gone. And then she was gone. What, what's going on? And then he says, there are different kinds of loss, Amber. Okay. What I'm saying is when, when he said that she was lost before she was lost, was that a confession of premeditated murder? Anyways, so despite any real physical evidence other than that one strand of hair, so the jury decided that there was enough motive to convict Scott of these murders. So Scott Peterson was found guilty of the murders of Lacey Peterson and baby Connor. He was sentenced to death. He was remanded to San Quentin State Penitentiary to carry out his sentence. Um, San Quentin is the only facility with death row in California. So death penalty cases are automatically appealed. That's just the way the law works, um, the legal process. So in 2012, Scott's attorneys appealed the jury selection as defective. They also claimed jury misconduct, improper evidence, improper testimony, all of, the, all of the things that you would expect to hear in a murder trial appeal. So they were essentially seeking a new trial for multiple reasons. So in March, 2019, pretty recently, California Governor Gavin Newsom signed an executive order that suspended all executions while he remains in office. So that applies to all 737 death row inmates in California. 
including Scott Peterson. But wait, there's another update. On August 24th, 2020, so like, yeah, two weeks, two weeks ago, the California Supreme Court overturned the death penalty in the Scott Peterson case on the basis of improper jury selection. But this decision did not overturn the conviction. So Scott Peterson remains guilty of the murder of Lacey Peterson and baby Connor. So Scott is still guilty of these crimes, but what this does is it makes him eligible for perhaps a new sentencing phase of the trial. It's not confirmed whether or not that will actually even happen. There has not been any date selected. The death penalty is actually still on the table. So even after the case evidence is re-examined and presented, he could still be awarded the death penalty. As long as Governor Newsom is in office, there is a stay of executions, but as soon as there's a new governor in town. So that is the story of the murder of Lacey Peterson. Let me know if you remember this story. Do you think Scott was guilty of it? Do you think that maybe he just had a lot of bad luck and was just maybe a bad dude who got in a pinch? Do you think he's an evil genius? What are your thoughts? Okay, so as a crew crime lover, I did wanna highlight really quickly another channel that I think you guys are going to love. So if you love makeup and murder stories, make sure you check out Brittany Vaughn. Brittany Vaughn is here on YouTube. I love her. She is a delightful little nugget. I, she's super talented at makeup and her storytelling is so good. I mean, these stories are terrible. They're awful. They're sad. They're gross a lot of times, but she, she makes it, she makes it funny and interesting. Sometimes I am cackling. Homeboy changed the lyrics of his song. He went on and he confessed to everything. So I love her. Make sure you check her out. I will link her channel down below. You're gonna love her. Thanks so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you wanna see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave. If you have not already, I upload new videos here on YouTube every week and you can follow me on some of the other social channels. All of the makeup that I used in today's look will be listed down in the description box. So if there's something interesting for you, just check down there. There's gonna be a link. Also, I wanted to thank you guys for your amazing response to the merch. I have launched a storefront with Threadless. It's linked down below. I've got some shirts, stickers, phone cases, face masks, and there might be some more really interesting crew crime stuff coming soon. So keep an eye out for that. That is it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye. Is the camera gonna focus today? <laughs> he told her to you guys, come on camera. You can do it. Sorry, that's crude. It's not funny. Fucking leaf blower. Gross. Can you guys hear the leaf blower? I'm sorry. It's not rocket science. Hello. Can I say something? You can eat it. <gasps> Bless you, child. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Give me a kiss. Now. Give it to me. Now. Fine, I'll just kiss these cheese balls. Do it. This makes me so happy. Thank you. I'm eating this for dinner tonight. <laughs> I love cheese balls.